Part 21. My doctrine is Bible-based. Yours is not, a.k.a. My dog is better than your dog. Three Christian doctrines, the Trinity, the Incarnation, and the Atonement, are widely recognized as influenced by both philosophical and biblical constructs, but are also peculiar to Christianity alone. The doctrine of the Trinity, for example, can be readily seen as having its roots in and springing out of scriptural texts, where man desires to compile applicable scriptures concerning the nature and relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and formulate a way of enunciating a comprehensive, balanced, and rational understanding. In contrast, doctrines focused on the orbiting of planets, laws of the cosmos, or laws of causation, e.g. fate or predestination, fall under a different category, as they are not the urgencies of Scripture. Such concerns are readily found in philosophical urgencies external to Christianity. Many theistic and non-theistic traditions, which are thoroughly extra-biblical or anti-biblical, entertain and dispute these doctrines. Since this is the case, it is easy to see the factors which influence Bible interpretations on these issues are powerful, yet represent extra-biblical philosophical distinctions, which can, more than is recognized, control the reading of Scripture, rather than the reverse. Additionally, Bible believers hold that Scripture is a reflection of truth. Therefore, Scripture will affirm what one holds to be true. If an individual is convinced that X is absolutely and infallibly true, that individual is willing to allow Scripture affirm X. If, however, an individual is convinced that X is false, that individual will not be willing to allow Scripture affirm X, because the Scripture does not affirm falsehoods. So you will not find any Christians angrily insisting. The Bible clearly teaches a moon made out of green cheese anytime soon. Such an assertion would be seen as idiotic, or the Christian who insisted upon it mentally unstable. But this represents an unseen vulnerability to the Bible believer. If someone can convince you that X is infallibly true, they are bound to find within the large volume of verses in the Bible texts that can be used to affirm X and apply inventive exegesis to prove it. Once that is accomplished, they can argue their doctrine is 100% biblical. Those under their influence may not be cognizant of philosophical and sociological forces at work in the reading of Scripture and are not psychologically predisposed to recognize agenda-based exegesis. There is the case of the Galileo Affair in the early 1600s, where theologians asserted that the Scriptures clearly teach a geocentric Aristotelian solar system. Galileo discovered with his telescope the movement of planets could be more accurately understood by the model Copernican expounded, where the Earth and planets orbit the Sun. This dispute could have been life-threatening for Galileo, as he dared to question the process of exegesis used by the theologians. Galileo did not believe that X, a geocentric system, was true. How then could the Bible teach something that is false? While the theologians did believe X was true and found verses and exegetical arguments to insist upon it. But Galileo recognized philosophical forces were driving the interpretation, which the theologians chose to deny. Thus, the theologian puts the cart before the horse, asserting the Bible is the source of the doctrine, when in fact an extra-biblical belief controls his interpretation. Therefore, Anyone who asserts his doctrinal tradition as 100% biblical, while accusing its competitor of less, is simply manifesting his ignorance of these factors, or has fallen victim to a guild of exegetical magicians. Scholar N.T. Wright, in Justification, whimsically writes, Romans 9-11 has become the happy hunting ground for theories about predestination. Bob Hill, author of Calvinism Unmasked, writes, Augustine agreed with the Manichaeans that a mutable God was totally unacceptable. In this conflict between the Platonic doctrine of immutability and the literal interpretation of scriptures, what had to change? Augustine's answer was that the literal interpretation of scripture 
had to change. For Augustine, the plain narratives of Scripture had to be reinterpreted by spiritual or allegorical methods to agree with his philosophical presuppositions. The Manichaeans believed the Old Testament revealed a God who was mutable or could repent. Since the Platonists believed that God was immutable, this idea of God repenting was a source of ridicule for the Catholic Church. Augustine was so embarrassed by these arguments that he chose to reinterpret Scripture rather than refute the Platonic philosophy. Part 22. Listing a few Calvinist language techniques. Since universal divine causal determinism is the lens through which the Calvinist sees God, along with a cosmos that entails dualistic morality, and since it inherently risks ascribing to God's conduct the very evils he declares he abhors, they perennially endure a backlash of shock, confusion, or disgust. These reactions affect Calvinism's reputation and evidence an observable hindrance to recruitment. In attempts to minimize this impact, a significant body of language techniques has evolved. Some of these techniques may include 1. Cloaking causal terminology within ambiguous religious words. 2. A high reliance upon words which can be interpreted as both universal and limited in scope. 3. A high reliance on euphemisms to obscure the dark side of the dualistic system. 4. Framing concepts of benevolence as both universal and non-universal. 5. Asserting A while abhorring not A, then later asserting not A. 6. Deploying eisegesis while claiming to abhor eisegesis. 7. Designing ad hoc arguments in Greek grammar, which collapse under expert scrutiny. 8. Using eulogistic religious language as an anesthesia to numb the shock of glorified evil. 9. Vividly describing evil while rejecting the common English labels for the evil described. 10. Vividly describing evil while inferring it good or necessary. 11. Rejecting libertarian free will in man while ascribing libertarian culpability to man. 12. Framing God's causation as active, then later framing the same causation as passive. 13. Asserting other theologies as heretical, and then deploying their language to appear benevolent. Part 23. The Language of Marketing, Benevolence and Equivocations on Selected Terms Since Calvin's published works raised no small degree of discomfort, and in some cases downright vitriol, he spent much time in the crafting of many words to defend and make his system as appealing as possible. Today the highly sophisticated use of language within the society is universally recognized, and Calvinists have become a force to reckon with in their superior abilities to craft language. Calvinism is certainly not alone in its strategic and expert use of language. We see the same linguistic skills in advertisements and seasoned politicians. The reader is asked to consider taking a serious look at the underlying rhetorical strategies used by anyone who would posture as a representative of Christ or of scriptural doctrine. If something is to be postured as biblical, certainly it would be enunciated using the same rhetorical honesty exemplified by the language of scripture. The Hebrew people could have easily equivocated and obfuscated in the narratives of King David taking Bathsheba and killing her husband, or Moses' disobedience at the waters of Meribah. But the scriptures do not follow a pattern of pulling semantic rabbits out of hats and making blatant logical contradictions magically disappear while claiming to abhor such things. If one seeks to make the claim of being biblical, one's language should at least meet the biblical criteria of linguistic honesty. William Lane Craig, in the book Four Views on Divine Providence, reflecting on his dialogues with Calvinist proponents within the work, remarks concerning this, and makes it his introductory statement. He notes how Calvinist proponents consistently fall short of enunciating what he calls the radical distinction that is foundational within the Calvinist system, that of universal divine causal determinism. 
Dr. Craig does not expand further on that reflection, but it does beg the question why it is consistently and historically the case, and whether it manifests a systemic marketing strategy of semantic underspecification. The Calvinist has an intense urgency to market the product, but he knows his enunciations of God's causal role in evil events will elicit shock, consternation, or repulsion, all which backfire his efforts. Calvinist language tends to be extremely reliant upon equivocations or evasions in five primary categories. 1. Words or terms which reflect causation. 2. Words or terms which represent God's disposition towards man. 3. Words or terms reflecting God's relationship to evil. 4. Words or terms having to do with salvation. 5. Words or terms having to do with man's condition. It should be easy to understand why these categories are of primary concern, but most non-Calvinists are simply not prepared for the large degree of marketing techniques, equivocations, and evasions that proliferate the language. Once one understands why these categories are of primary concern for the Calvinist, being on the lookout with due diligence is certain to yield results in abundance. Alan Greenspan was noted as saying, If what I just said makes sense to you, then you probably didn't understand what I just said. Ronald Reagan was noted for the saying, Trust, but verify, verify, verify. These are good things to remember as you attempt to deconstruct Calvinist language. Review every word, looking for hidden meanings, hidden presuppositions, irrationalities, and subtleties. Rhetorical trickery will be proportionate to the reputation of the author, but be advised that Calvinists of little reputation will often deploy language tricks designed by the masters. Once you become familiar with the general library of semantic tricks, you eventually gain an intuitive sense for spotting them. Part 24. Compartmentalization of Information. Outsider versus Insider Language. It is wonderfully refreshing to see Calvinists themselves identify the problems others see. We applaud Professor Dr. Paul Owen and thank him for being true to Christ. He writes the following. People are sometimes surprised to hear me. A Calvinist speak of the tulip cult. What do I mean when I speak this way? By a cult, I mean a sect within the broad landscape of Christianity which takes as its operating center some principle other than Christ crucified. This is certainly the case for the young, restless, and reformed. It is obvious that the operating center which holds this movement together is tulip and not the gospel of the cross. One gets the impression that their sense of identity is inseparable from their sense of superiority. Stephen Allen Hassan is a licensed mental health counselor with extensive knowledge on the practices of religious groups. One of the characteristics he helps people look for, he calls outsider versus insider information. The group implements recruitment efforts for the obvious reasons, but the recruitment processes soon lead to the strategic use of subtle rhetorical practices, which fall under the heading of semantic underspecification. Group members are taught how to speak to outsiders who may be in opposition to the group and how to speak to an outsider who may be potentially recruited. Hassan calls this outsider language. Outsider language incorporates the use of semantic ambiguities of definition and especially the tactic of semantic underspecification. What Hassan means is the recruiter simply doesn't tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth when he speaks. Group members may be persuaded that God is blinding the eyes of the outsider so that he cannot understand the sacred doctrine. When the reality may very well be that the outsider recognizes elements of obfuscation and semantic discrepancies, but is not expert enough in the use of language or the doctrines of the group to recognize how and what semantic strategies the group typically deploys. Group members may be convinced that since their doctrine represents the gospel and skillful linguistic tactics may be deemed honorable and a measurement of the intellectual prowess of the man, 
Even if there is no intent to be dishonest, the line soon becomes blurred, and dishonesty becomes a necessary evil, which is then rationalized as honoring God and defending His truth. A long-term problem then becomes ambiguous language tactics deployed, and a conscience soon overpowered by a facade of righteousness. Group members may become idolized based on their abilities to deploy slick biblical or logical-sounding language or posture speaking with authority. Sometimes little packs start to form by group members, reminiscent of dog packs, where a hierarchy and respecting of persons emerges based upon the intellectual or linguistic prowess of persons within the pack. There is also the possibility that group representatives do not mean to be intentionally surreptitious, but as the group evolves, one of its hidden strengths becomes semantic magicianry. One of the most successful ways to tell a lie and not be detected is to simply divulge a limited amount of the truth. When a person tells a lie, there is the possibility of verifying its truth value. But for that information which is carefully withheld, there is nothing to verify. So liars learn how to withhold information and fill in the missing gaps with connotative, religious, or moral high ground language in order to give the appearance of providing honest, comprehensive, or rational statements. Part 25. Ambiguous Terms and Ad Hoc Definitions. Shifting Semantic Landmarks. In a court of law, those persons who have a critical role in the official dialogue during proceedings all work from one prescribed lexicon of words. Agent and instrument have two distinctly different meanings, and the court strictly forbids them being conflated. Freely committing the crime has a distinctly different meaning from caused to commit the crime. And again, the court strictly forbids such terms from being conflated. Permitted to commit the crime and caused to commit the crime are not to be conflated. The reason for such lexical strictness should be self-evident. The court's urgency is the discovery of truth. Without truth, the word justice is meaningless. Without truth, the word holiness is meaningless. Without truth, the word righteousness is meaningless. And the truth value of everything we know or think we know hinges upon our definition of it. When God commanded Noah to build an ark or Moses to build the tabernacle, the process involved the use of words. These words, exchanged between God and man, included words defining numerical values and units of measure, as in 50 cubits. We should easily recognize the critical nature of a commonly shared lexicon between persons. The building of a boat or a tabernacle could not be possible if God and man do not share the same exact meaning for all words used in the dialogue. Remove not the ancient landmark. Proverbs 22.8 A just weight is God's delight. Proverbs 11.1 1. Altered word definitions, especially concerning the things of God, should represent a significant warning sign that something untoward is at work. Part 26. Word Games and the Urgency to Market the Product A young man takes a girl up to Lover's Lane, and she soon discovers his intent. As he reaches, she puts up her hand, making a stop motion. Before we do this, I need to know if you love me, she says sternly. And the young man knows what the girl's definition of the word love is. He knows she defines love as monogamous commitment. If he speaks honestly and answers her question using her definition for the word love, his answer will be no. In such case, his quest will be foiled. So, he reasons within himself that he must mislead her. Of course I love you, he says, and then fills in using language he knows she will trust. Argument by emotive language. But the caveat is, he won't tell her what type of love he has in mind. His strategy is another form of insider language. He knows what her definition for love is, but he creates an ad hoc definition for the word and retains his definition as insider information.
It should be clear to all that this is the language of marketing, cunning politicians, and religious recruiters. Jerry Walls, a scholar and professor of philosophy, gives a video presentation, which he calls What's Wrong with Calvinism? During the presentation, Walls relates a situation in which young Calvinist pastors have asked an older Calvinist theologian and professor if it would be honest for them to tell people that God loves them. Here it is visible that Calvinists themselves struggle with issues of linguistic honesty forced upon them by the system. The theologian's response is illuminating because it follows the same line of reasoning used by the young man at Lover's Lane. He assured them, of course you can tell them God loves them. But the caveat is, you can't tell them what type of love God has for them. How would people respond if you told them that the type of love God has for them is the type of love that will throw them into a lake of fire for his good pleasure? It would be nice to tell them the type of love God has for them is the type of love that is full of benevolence for them. But for a Jesus-honoring Calvinist, that could not be honest. So they are counseled to deploy benevolent-sounding half-truths. That these young men couldn't see through such advice as dishonest is evidence that the system teaches its adherents to become good at using sleight-of-words tactics in order to make the product appear appealing and to achieve buy-in. It is well understood that pharmaceutical companies, in order to market a product, will release results from laboratory tests, which would induce consumer buy-in, while withholding results which would make them avoid it. This is the classic closed file cabinet trick. Results from laboratory tests are carefully tucked away in the back of a file cabinet where no one will ever see them. The strategy is to make the product appear as appealing as possible while obfuscating its dangerous or distasteful characteristics. Jerry Walls concludes this phenomenon within Calvinism by stating, If Calvinists did not resort to these types of misleading rhetoric, Calvinism would lose credibility in two years. All of these evidences of Calvinist language games seem to point to a systemic compromise with ethics in order to market the product. It raises the specter of a group so radically biased it is unable to recognize unethical tactics in its own midst or whether the necessity for and rationalizations of dishonesties was long ago embedded within its tradition. Part 27. Calvinism's Embrace of Compatibilistic Free Will In philosophy, compatibilism is the assertion that free will and determinism are conceptually and logically compatible. The compatibilist, for example, believes that it is possible for the thoughts, words, and deeds of a human to be predestined in such a way as to be unavoidable and causally necessary, and yet be said to operate in accordance to a form of free will. The compatibilist asserts a definition of free will that is radically different from what is known as libertarian free will. The libertarian sense of free will is typically stated as the ability to refrain or the ability to do otherwise, and includes alternate possibilities in life events. In other words, a person who perpetrated or participated in an event had the liberty and ability not to. Compatibilists define free will as the freedom to act according to one's internal inclinations without external forces applied by another individual. In philosophy, compatibilism is a form of soft determinism, and it is common by compatibilists to view man as a machine, as one might view a high-precision clock. All of man's thoughts, words, and deeds evolve through interactions, which occur internally, within the biomechanisms of the man. So, it is in this way, man is said to function according to internal mechanical inclinations. This is very similar to the concept of a man functioning as a highly complex biological machine, whose every thought, word, and deed are controlled by predefined software algorithms which are designed to reside internally within the biological mechanism. Harry G. Frankfurt, 1929, an American philosopher, described compatibilism in terms of internal inclinations 
that may be antagonistic to one another. Frankfurt described these as first order or second order inclinations. Frankfurt asserted that the inclination, which ends up becoming dominant, represented the individual's real self and therefore should be seen as an explanation for free will. The compatibilist sense of free will is internationally categorized as a metaphysical distinction and is rejected in aspects of English law. Compatibilists may assert that the compatibilist form of free will can be present in non-metaphysical events. However, for legal precedence, a compatibilistic sense of free will is thought to undermine the ability to determine a person's causal role to an event. That is to say, justice requires the presumption that an individual could have done otherwise than he did. The terms mens rea and actus reus developed within English law represent principles in which a general test of guilt requires proof of fault, culpability, or blameworthiness, both in thought and action. For example, person A shoots person B while having an epileptic seizure would not meet the mens rea mental requirements for legal culpability, and an airplane being blown off course into a foreign country's airspace would not meet the actus reus, action requirements for legal culpability. A few other examples of common distinctions include voluntary manslaughter in regard to murder and of sound mind in regard to a will and testament. The libertarian sense of free will must first be established within the body of evidence as proof of culpability, and in most cases is assumed. Compatibilism was first observed in the writings of the Greek Stoics of Augustine's period, and later in medieval scholastics. Ricardo Sales, author of God and Cosmos in Stoicism, writes, the Stoics were determinists insofar as they maintained that every state or event is necessitated by prior causes, but at the same time they were compatibilists since they were willing to defend the thesis that prior necessitation does not make impossible that we deserve praise or blame for actions we perform. So the Stoics were intent on proving that despite determinism, humans are genuinely responsible for their actions. The distinction of compatibilistic free will is still the prevailing philosophical view among Calvinists. Some cognitive scientists, such as Daniel Dennett, 1942, some existentialist philosophers, such as Frithjof Bergman, 1930, and some Muslim scholars, such as Muhammad Abdu, 1849. Calvinist theologian and philosopher Jonathan Edwards, in The Freedom of the Will, writes, it most certainly is the case that God is in that manner the disposer and orderer of sin is evident to anyone who puts any credit in the Bible, as well as being evident because it is impossible in the nature of things that it should be otherwise. Edwards obviously embraces the system's underlying presupposition of universal divine causal determinism. He argues that whatever a divine being does must be unquestionably considered right and that the creature is in no position to question such things. Philosophers view Edwards as an advocate of compatibilistic free will in defense of Calvinistic distinctions. He additionally asserts that even though God moves every human faculty, humans are still to be considered agents and not mere instruments. It is questionable whether Calvin was familiar with the distinctions of compatibilism versus libertarianism, because in his writings, Calvin consistently swings back and forth between the two opposing non-libertarian, libertarian, conceptions of free will in his arguments. Rejecting libertarian free will in one argument and then requiring it in the next. In those instances in which Calvin is intent upon asserting God's sovereignty or relationship to good, Calvin firmly and explicitly argues from a non-libertarian and fully deterministic position. Additionally, Calvin may often cast harsh dispersions upon any libertarian concept of man's will as hideous nonsense. However, when Calvin is intent on eulogizing God's role in sin or evil and holding man solely culpable for the things God meticulously makes him do, Calvin relies upon the very libertarian free will he just rejected.
in order for his argument to appear coherent. Calvin's consistent trading back and forth on two opposing concepts of free will points to two possibilities, that he was confused and conflated the two concepts, or he was equivocating causal terminology in an attempt to make both arguments look coherent. Essentially, Calvin argues, 1. God is the sole causal agent in all events and gives man absolutely no alternative possibilities for function or faculty. 2. Man is solely responsible for sinful, evil things God makes him do. 3. God is solely responsible for good things God makes man do. Ever since modern philosophers took up the distinction of compatibilistic free will, Calvinists have valued it as it supports the deterministic foundation of the doctrine. However, it can present additional temptations for dishonesty in their recruitment efforts. When a Calvinist is enunciating Calvinistic distinctions to a mainstream Christian, it is not unusual for them to be asked if they reject free will. Without realizing it, the mainstream Christian is asking if the Calvinist believes in libertarian free will. The Calvinist may often take advantage of this dialogue as he understands the distinction of deterministic. Compatibilistic free will versus libertarian free will, while the mainstream Christian does not. So the Calvinist can respond with, of course we believe in free will. What he withholds, however, is what type of free will he has in mind. So again, we are back to the linguistic strategy of the young man at Lover's Lane and the use of insider language. You can imagine what a person's response would be when told the type of free will the Calvinist has in mind is one in which God conceives, decrees, and meticulously renders certain that a person will choose damnation and a lake of fire for eternity. Calvinists are well aware that mainstream Christians would find that type of free will appalling. And so, equivocating on causal terminology in order to obfuscate the system's radical distinction is all too often the natural and human thing to do. Consequently, the combination of their urgency to propagate and the common negative receptivity to its dark elements drives them to use misleading, obfuscating, and benevolent-sounding language in order to make the system appear appealing to the unsuspecting. Part 28. Major Points of Contention Within Philosophical Disputes Over Determinism Peter van Inwagen, 1942, a Christian analytic philosopher, in The Consequence Argument, writes, If determinism is true, then our acts are the consequences of the laws of nature and events in the remote past. But it is not up to us what went on before we were born, and neither is it up to us what the laws of nature are. Therefore, the consequences of those things, including our present acts, are not up to us. A brief review of the points of contention, which perennially orbit around the philosophies of determinism versus indeterminism, can be cited as questions concerning 1. The existence of libertarian free will 2. The sacrifice of ethics and morality in deference to utilitarian power 3. Man as an instrument rather than an agent 4. A conception of man operating simply by pre-designed mechanical inclinations, i.e. a robot. It is no surprise to observe these are, in fact, same exact points of contention between Calvinism and its alternatives, once one realizes the system is founded upon the often invisible element of causal determinism, one could conceivably differentiate those components within Calvinism, whose source can clearly be traced to Christianity, apart from those components whose source can clearly be traced to the philosophy of causal determinism. And to additionally consider the component of causal determinism as the primary cause of contention between Calvinism and its alternatives. As has been noted, all of the major points of contention, which have orbited around perennial debates between Calvinists, are the same exact points of contention, which have perennially orbited around debates between determinists and non-determinists in the field of philosophy.
It is interesting to consider the scurrilous and contentious arguments and almost hateful emotions that so often accompany disputes which have occurred between Christians over one single issue, and how that issue may in fact not be an issue of scripture but rather an issue of philosophy. Obviously, the effect that determinism and non-determinism has had on human concepts of the nature and character of God and the world in which he has created cannot be understated. Just as nature abhors a vacuum, all philosophical propositions inherently produce logical consequences. Part 29. Compatibilistic Responsibility versus Libertarian Responsibility. Halting between two opinions. In this section, I hope to forward a line of reasoning that both the Calvinist and non-Calvinist can acknowledge, having to do with the elements of free will and responsibility, often called moral responsibility. Firstly, it is commonly acknowledged that free will in any form comes with some form of responsibility. All parties, i.e. Calvinists and non-Calvinists, hold that man has some form of free will, along with its associated moral responsibilities. Since Calvinism is founded upon theological causal determinism, Calvinists have quite naturally embraced a compatibilistic form of free will, while the non-Calvinist, who is an indeterminist, holds to a libertarian form of free will. Secondly, all parties hold that compatibilistic free will, on man's part, is a free will, which is causally determined by God, and that God, in the exercise of his sovereignty over all states of affairs, which obtain, does not allow alternate possibilities beyond what he determines to obtain. On this view, for example, man has a free will in which a certain human function can obtain, but whatever specific human function obtains does so because God causally determines that specific function to obtain, and as such, no other alternative function can possibly obtain. And so it follows that the compatibilistic form of free will is acknowledged as a limited form of free will, as it pertains to human faculties, by virtue of the fact that God does not allow any alternative possibilities outside of what he causally determines to obtain. In other words, man is not at liberty to exercise whatever faculty he chooses, which would be true in libertarian free will, because God solely causally determines every human function or faculty that will obtain. Thirdly, all parties would acknowledge that God himself has free will, and generally this would be cited as a libertarian form of free will, because as we have seen, the libertarian form of free will is not limited, as the compatibilist form of free will is. This is to say that God is free to will as many alternate possibilities as are logically possible for him to choose. And since God's free will is not causally determined by any outside entity, person, or antecedent event, his free will does not have the limitations that we observe within a compatibilistic form of free will imposed upon man. Now we must point out at this time that some things are not possible for God. For example, let's say that God wants to causally determine that a certain event, which we will call event positive E, will obtain. And let us also say that it is possible for God to causally determine an alternative event, which we will call event negative E to obtain. And let us further say that event negative E is the exact negation of event positive E. Now we see that either event is possible for God to cause to obtain, but it is not logically possible for God to make both events obtain at the same time, because one event will negate the other, and in such case, neither event will obtain. It is assumed that all parties will acknowledge that God is not illogical, making two opposing events occur in such a way that both events negate each other. In other words, it is not possible for God to negate himself. And as such, it is not logical, and therefore possible, for God to negate what he wills to obtain. Or further, it is not logically possible for God to be both God and not God. So far, we have identified three conceivable forms of free will. 1. God's free will. 2. Man's compatibilistic free will.
3. Man's Libertarian Free Will Now since all parties acknowledge that all forms of free will entail some form of moral responsibility, we can then acknowledge that each of the three forms of free will identified have their own perspective form of moral responsibility. Now let us cite some examples of how each form of free will and its associated responsibility may interact with each other in human events which God causes to obtain. In the case that a human baby is born, we have a human event. In such an event, it would seem evident, all parties would acknowledge, a newborn baby cannot be held responsible for the selection of its mother, through whom it is born. All parties would hold that the choice of the infant's mother is exclusively God's to make. God determines what babies will be born to what mothers, and that is God's choice exclusively. Therefore, it should be acknowledged that the associated responsibility that would come with that choice is solely God's. Another way to say this is that the infant has 0% choice and 0% responsibility in choosing its mother, and that God has 100% choice along with 100% of the responsibility for choosing what mother will birth a given infant. So we see that there are human events which God causes to obtain in which he bears 100% of the responsibility. We have already established that during a compatibilistic free will event, God only allows that which he has determined to obtain. Now let us say God causes a human to think a certain thought and let us call that event DCT, divinely caused thought. This type of free will event, as it pertains to the human, constitutes a limited form of free will exercised by the human. But there is no such limitation in God's exercise of his free will in causing DCT to obtain. Now, it certainly would seem implausible that any party would deny that God, exercising his free will in causing event DCT to obtain, would not rightly assume the associated responsibility that is proportionate with that free will which God has exercised. In other words, no party would assert that God exercises his free will irresponsibly. Therefore, since we acknowledge that God assumes his form of free will responsibility, and if man assumes his form of limited free will responsibility, it would follow that the percentage of responsibility which man would rightly assume would be rightly proportionate to the limited form of free will man is allowed to exercise. And conversely, that the percentage of responsibility that God will rightly assume will likewise be rightly proportionate to the less limited free will he exercises. We might consider it highly difficult to ascertain the exact proportion of responsibility which God would rightly assume in event DCT compared to the proportion of responsibility which the human should rightly assume. But since we acknowledge that within event DCT, man's free will is limited in a way that God's free will is not, it wouldn't seem logical or ethical to claim that the percentage of responsibility that man should rightly assume would represent 100%, since that would represent a false balance and disproportionate to the limited form of free will allotted to man, compared to the less limited form of free will exercised by God. If man's form of free will is significantly limited within his exercise of event DCT, compared to God's form of free will in causing it, could we rightly claim that man bears the bulk of the responsibility? It would seem that making such a claim would put us dangerously close to asserting a false balance, which we understand through Scripture, God abhors. Rather than place ourselves in a position of operating in something that God would abhor, it would seem prudent for us to simply allow man to assume that burden of responsibility that is rightly proportionate to his limited form of free will and honor God by acknowledging he will rightly assume that burden of responsibility that is rightly proportionate to his less limited form of free will. Let us now contrast event DCT, divinely caused thought,
with an event in which God allows man to have a thought within a libertarian free will state of affairs. Let us call this next event NDCT, i.e., non-divinely caused thought. In the NDCT event, God does not cause the man to have any specific thought. Man is given the liberty of having his own thoughts, which includes the liberty to refrain from a given thought. In this state of affairs, then, God does not limit man's free will or alternate possibilities, as God does in the causally determined state of affairs. Since it is the case that in this state of affairs, man's exercise of NDCT is less determined by God and more determined by himself than it is within the causally determined state of affairs, it then follows that in this case, man's responsibility for NDCT would be rightly proportionate to the type of free will exercised. If God in this case refrains from causally determining NDCT to obtain, then we should honor God by acknowledging that He will rightly ascribe the right proportionate or percentage of responsibility to Himself for this event. It would seem unethical to ascribe a high percentage of responsibility to God for NDCT. Then God would ascribe to Himself in the previous causally determined case. In this libertarian free will case, then, it would seem ethical and just for us to ascribe the preponderance of responsibility to man, as God has allotted him a proportionally freer form of free will to exercise. It would seem unethical and a false balance for us to assert that in a causally determined state of affairs, God causally determines every human function in such a way as not to allow any alternative possibilities, and then ascribes to himself absolutely no responsibility for his exercise of free will in such an event. For us to assert such a thing would seem to seriously dishonor God and risk operating in a false balance which God would abhor. Certainly, we would want to honor God by both acknowledging that He rightly assumes His portion of responsibility for the free will He exercises, and additionally, we would want to refrain from promoting a false balance, which we know He would abhor. Therefore, I would suggest that for either party to ascribe all of the responsibility to man, for those functions which God causes to obtain and allows no alternative, would, in fact, constitute a false balance, as well as seriously dishonor the good name of a righteous God, who is perfect in all His ways. Part 30. Hyper-Calvinism, sacrificial straw man, or simply a hard determinist. The sacrificial straw man is a trick designed to distract people's attention from distasteful aspects of one's theory. It works firstly by fabricating a fanatical version, then secondly, shooting that version down, giving the appearance of distancing oneself from the fabricated extreme in order to fabricate the appearance of balanced moderation. It is used to obfuscate the radical distinctions of one's system. We find this trick used by wine retailers who strategically locate a few exorbitantly priced bottles amidst the others on display. It consistently works to manipulate the unsuspecting consumer who will naturally gravitate to a median-priced item. People want to avoid appearing extreme, not too cheap, not too wealthy, so they will select bottles in the median price range. With a few hundred-dollar bottles strategically located, the mean distribution of purchases will approximate $30. Whereas if the $30 bottle were the most expensive items, the mean distribution would approximate $10 to $15 purchases. So we can see the strategy works to manipulate people by taking advantage of common human egocentric idiosyncrasies. As has been stated, in ongoing debates held between philosophers concerning determinism, compatibilism is the view that determinism and free will are logically consistent. We then find that compatibilists are at odds with incompatibilists, who come in two forms, libertarians, i.e., indeterminists, and hard determinists. Compatibilism is then also at odds with hard determinism. Hard determinists totally deny free will in any form and hold to a cosmos, which is completely deterministic. The terms hard determinism and soft determinism were coined by William James, 
1842, an American philosopher, psychologist, and libertarian who held compatibilism in disdain. James criticized compatibilism, asserting it offered a kinder, gentler picture of determinism, which he held in strong contempt, stating, Nowadays, there is a softer view of determinism, which abhors harsh words and attempts to repudiate necessity by simply calling it freedom. James felt compatibilists were superficial and called their arguments a bag of verbal tricks which they deploy as a way to avoid the real intellectual problems of free will and the entire compatibilist enterprise is a quagmire of evasion. He felt that compatibilists were trying to avoid the reality of a deterministic world with semantic tricks and verbal sleight of hand. The German philosopher Immanuel Kant, 1724, held to a similar view, calling compatibilism a wretched subterfuge. What is more interesting is that both James and Kant felt that the hard determinists were the honorable and intellectually honest ones, who faced the problems of determinism and free will head-on, calling them worthy adversaries. In fact, many in philosophy today hold that compatibilism is the product of wishful thinking and of wanting to have the best of both worlds, i.e., the benefits of determinism and the responsibility of libertarian free will at the same time. So, within philosophy, the hard determinist holds that determinism is true, and free will in any form is simply an illusion. There are two components typically cited within hard determinism. Hard determinists reject compatibilism, asserting that compatibilists do not want to face the logical implications of free will adequately. But while they feel that the libertarian definition of free will is the only logical definition, they also insist that free will in any form does not really exist. This view is then sometimes called the error view, or free will eliminativism, because the hard determinist is convinced that the notion of free will is simply a cognitive error, and mankind should eliminate the notion altogether. So then, the soft determinist's view of the hard determinist is that he is a hyper-determinist who takes things too far. While the hard determinist's view of the soft determinist is that he is not willing to bite the bullet and be intellectually honest. This polarization within the philosophy of determinism may also have its parallel within Calvinism, since Calvinism is based upon the doctrine of universal divine causal determinism, it would be easy to assume the same two types of determinists exist within the Calvinist fold. Many times when defending themselves against criticism, Calvinists will insist that what is being depicted of them is an aberrant form of Calvinism called hyper-Calvinism. It is true that the preponderance of Calvinists are soft determinists, and so they often urge non-Calvinist critics to cease their criticisms, asserting the real culprits as the hyper ones among them. However, to date, no Calvinists have come forward actually declaring themselves as hyper. Therefore, within the population of Calvinists, those who are the hyper ones appear to be as elusive as the famed Bigfoot. It is speculated, then, that hyper ones exist within Calvinism, but it is hard to prove, as none are willing to publicly self-identify with the pejorative label ascribed by their clan. It does seem to be understandable that just as there are different persons within philosophy, each assuming his individual position on the continuum of determinism, i.e., a line which stretches between soft determinism and hard determinism, that this would also be reflected within the Society of Calvinists. However, there are also no known books published by Calvinist authors who seem willing to identify as hyper. And this brings to light another problem. With the evident elusiveness of the hyper-ones in their midst, those Calvinists, who are frequently noted as rejecting hyper-Calvinism, do in fact produce a significant body of literature in which Calvinistic concepts are defined in the very forms which they decry as hyper. And this phenomenon makes observers wonder if the hyper-Calvinist is, in fact, a fabricated straw man who doesn't really exist.
It may also be the case that certain Calvinists who interact in internal debates within their own society do self-identify as hyper, or perhaps rather see themselves as the intellectually honest ones who take Calvinism to its logical conclusions. If such Calvinists do in fact exist, we may also assume how readily they understand the negative reactions their hyper-enunciations would produce, and in order to therefore advance the cause, promote the system, increasing the surplus Calvinist population, are careful to keep their hyper-form of Calvinism behind closed doors where it is least likely to cause trouble. Part 31 Jacob I love, Esau I hate, Calvinism's petri dish of the Westboro Baptist kind. It has often been noted that one extreme benefit that Catholicism provides to Christianity is its unabashed representations of religiosity and debauchery. Over the centuries, Catholic authorities have occasionally become so brazen they felt no need to obfuscate or hide anti-Christian pagan sentiments. And in this regard, the Catholic Church seems to provide an endless supply of examples for the discerning Christian. There is, for example, the well-known statement by Pope Leo VI, How well we know what a profitable superstition this fable of Christ has been for us and our predecessors. Leo's blessed pronouncement is recorded in the diaries and records of both Pietro Cardinal Bembo, Letters and Comments on Pope Leo Theirs, 1842 reprint, and Paolo Cardinal Jovio, De Vita Leonis de Cimi, Apurin Sit. Later, to minimize negative impact, ministers of spin attempted damage control, with the very semantic evasions and doublespeak we are now studying. They asserted the you don't understand us argument, insisting the Pope had been misunderstood. When he used the word profitable, he didn't mean it by its common definition, but what would be better understood as gainful. Likewise, when he used the word fable, he didn't mean it by its common definition, but what would be better understood as tradition. But these attempts at semantic word games have been received with incredulity since, in the same way a woman proudly displays her jewelry, the Catholic Church has, in so many ways, vaunted her pagan adornments. Since the Catholic Church manifests its bacterium so clearly and unashamedly, the system serves as a rich textbook of maladies. As the physician studies symptoms of various diseases represented within medical textbooks, to best recognize them in future patients, one can study the various indicators and symptoms within Catholicism, which will later appear within other religious bodies. In this regard, the Catholic Church has provided a veritable petri dish, readily available for ongoing examination. Calvinism, likewise, has its petri dish, and one of its more interesting life forms appears at the Westboro Baptist Church, located in Topeka, Kansas. This little church was established on the east side of Topeka. Fred Phelps, 1929, at age 17, attended Bob Jones University for two years before dropping out, citing racial issues as the reason for his departure. It is alleged former college employees told the Topeka Capital Journal that Phelps had been given an ultimatum to seek psychiatric care or be expelled. Phelps was a Calvinist of the most serious kind, insisting, as Calvin did, that all sins committed by men come about by the impulses of God. The Westboro Church initiated its first service with Phelps as pastor in 1955. In a 1994 story in the Topeka Capital Journal, Phelps' sons, Nathan and Mark, said their father used the pulpit to vent his rage and that he beat his wife and children with his fists or the handle of a mattock to the point of bleeding shortly. After becoming Westboro's pastor, Phelps broke ties with nearby Baptist congregations and renamed the church using the term Primitive Baptist. The terms Primitive Baptist or Primitive Christian often serve as cloaked language for Calvinism, especially during a church's infancy in its attempts to maximize recruitment potential. Other terms such as Grace Assembly also work as code names for Calvinist congregations, 
cloaked names help attract people who would otherwise avoid a Calvinist assembly. The Westboro group averaged around 40 members, a little over the norm for a Calvinized congregation. Calvinists interpret Christ's statement that few will enter in to mean that God only elects few individuals as vessels of honor for salvation, while electing the remaining many as vessels of wrath. Therefore, it is common for Calvinist groups to be small in number, averaging around 20 persons, mostly in the form of families. Although Pastor Phelps and the Westboro group do not self-identify as hyper, they have been denounced by the Baptist World Alliance and the Southern Baptist Convention as such. Due to a glorified evil dualistic and deterministic worldview, we can see that Calvinists are faced with the same consternations within their internal subgroups that exist between mainstream Christianity and Calvinists as a whole. Pastor Phelps and the Westboro Group eventually became widely recognized throughout the U.S. for hate speech, especially against gays, Jews, and various politicians. And the Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center have also similarly cited them. Westboro Calvinists are noted for their aggressive public activities, heavily involved in picketing, carrying signs displaying messages such as, Thank God for 9-11, Thank God for IEDs, Thank God for Dead Soldiers, and God Hates Fags. Libby Phelps Alvarez, the granddaughter of Pastor Phelps, states that she was born and raised in the group, but eventually left after questioning its doctrines and practices. One of the issues Libby questioned concerned the practice of praying for the deaths of outsiders. Libby and her brother Nathan both acknowledge they believed in and participated in the group because of its effective indoctrination practices. Lauren Drain was brought into the group at the age of 14 by her father while in his custody. In her book, Banished, Surviving My Years in the Westboro Baptist Church, Lauren identifies the group as exhibiting the characteristics of a cult and asserts the group exercised psychological control over its members similar to what we find described by Robert J. Lifton, 1926, an American psychiatrist, as thought reform. Shirley Phelps, the daughter of Fred Phelps, after having also left the group, lamented on television that a whole generation of her children are emotionally and psychologically scared as a byproduct of the group. Megan Phelps Roper, another granddaughter who also left the group, likens the group's dynamics to that of jihadists, with a Taliban-like theocracy. She cites the fact that the group insisted upon the eternal torment of outsiders based upon their conduct, but would not apply the same reasoning for persons within the group who were involved in similar sins. This began to bother Megan, and she eventually dared to question it. The group's teachings sternly condemn persons to eternal damnation based on conduct, despite the logical contradiction that God meticulously causally determined those persons' conduct. But this was not the case for group insiders whose sins were declared forgiven. A controversy arose when Megan asked what would happen if an outsider repented. She was scolded and told outsiders were all damned for eternal torment because God would make sure they could not repent. Megan remembers a televised documentary reporter being told things like, God is going to enjoy flicking you into a lake of fire. It was these logical and ethical conundrums which eventually jolted Megan to her senses and compelled her to leave. Megan also reflected Westboro was ISIS-like, recalling an article she read in the New Yorker magazine in 2015 titled Journey to Jihad, Why Are Teenagers Joining ISIS?, she relates how the Westboro group's reading of scripture was identical to the reading of the Quran she observed with the jihadist group Sharia for Belgium. Another characteristic paralleling the religion of Islam was its public insistence that the deaths of Belgium police and politicians were the punishment of Allah, or in the case of Westboro, the punishment of God. And yet she also recalls the goodness of God that she saw displayed between family members in the group.
it would appear that what Megan is reflecting on is, in fact, the glorified evil dualistic system. Megan describes her life as a teenager, walking outside the high school she attended to picket the school during her lunch breaks, reflecting a form of doublethink. There was also a prevalent insider-outsider mindset that Megan cited as a very strong characteristic, stating, a frequent teaching in the group was, you are either a Jacob or an Esau. God loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born. Megan left the group when she was 27. Although she is not willing to label the group a cult, she does acknowledge what she calls cult-like indicators, group think, group identity, and selective empathy. Megan states, The stronger your identity as an insider in the group grows, the more you are able to suppress empathy for outsiders. And this biased suppression of empathy is reinforced as group members experience collisions with outsiders, increasing antagonism against them. She further states, The indoctrination, it's all or nothing. There can be no difference of opinion no matter how slight, in matters of conscience within group members. When you are a member of a group, where your whole life is tied up in it, the threat of excommunication can be hung over your head. Using Westboro as a textbook case, what we see then are the socialization processes that are consistent within Calvinistic groups, where there is milieu control, a high emphasis on elect status, and a high emphasis on group conformity and unanimity. Many Calvinists strongly deny association with what they cite as a radical fringe, while conversely, many Calvinists see themselves as the true believers and other Christians as compromised and defend the Westboro group as good Calvinists all. Our vantage point in all this is that it provides a view of Calvinism's petri dish and a textbook view of the same systemic symptoms within all who take their Calvinism seriously. The same exact tenor, tone, and topics of disputations occur between Calvinists and outsiders that exist with the Westboro group, howbeit, obviously, in less extreme form. But Calvinist controversies, whether they manifest enlarged, Westboro style, or in miniature, are in fact due to the same underlying elements of a good evil dualism and universal divine causal determinism, and the Calvinist Petri dish is thus informative for the discerning Christian. Part 32. Calvinist Disputation Techniques The Bullfighter, the Carrot, the Wolf Pack, the Snowflake. The Calvinist's continuum line of determinism was previously mentioned. It is wise to understand how this works within the ranks of Calvinists. Since Calvinism is founded upon the presupposition of universal divine causal determinism, and since that presupposition inherently entails God having a direct determinative causal role in evil, each Calvinist is forced to deal with the dark implications that are inherent within the system, and each Calvinist does that in his own unique way. This can be likened to the Calvinist finding a comfortable location on a line. The line is the continuum of determinism, where one extreme end of the line points to indeterminism and the other extreme end points to hard determinism. Within the Calvinist society, the Calvinist who locates himself at the extreme hard determinism end may well be cited as hyper. Using a bell curve representing standard deviation, the preponderance of Calvinists are going to reside as close to the indeterminist side of the line as possible, while still retaining an emphasis on sovereignty, which would tend to pull them up the line towards hard determinism. So understanding how each Calvinist embraces and retains his conscience on the line of determinism allows us to predict his representations of Calvinism. Bullfighting is a traditional spectacle and highly entertaining in various parts of the world. What we want to look at here are a few illuminating aspects of this sport and how it applies to dialogues with Calvinists. If you have ever seen bullfighting on television at the onset of the event, where the bull and the man face each other, you probably have been struck by the significant contrast between the two parties. The bull 
is a huge mass of muscle and power, and quite often the bullfighter, a tall, skinny-looking, and string bean of a man. The contrast of power in this spectacle is quite impactful. The man is reliant upon the bull's limited intelligence. He positions himself, usually standing behind his bright red cape, and imitates the body language of aggression, to which he knows the bull will respond. The bull charges the cape, thinking he is charging the man. The man then steps to the side of the cape, so the bull is unwittingly no longer charging the man, but the cap. As the bull reaches the cap, usually with head down, in full charge, the man simply flicks the cap out of the way and the bull is left charging thin air. This process then repeats itself, and the bull is not intelligent enough to know how the strategy works. This sport can occur between a Calvinist and interlocutor. The Calvinist may assert the interlocutor is not qualified to critique Calvinism because he doesn't understand it. The Calvinist hopes he can simply dismiss the interlocutor out of hand with this charge or become an unwitting bull. Here we have the shaking of the red cape to confront the bull. If the interlocutor is unprepared for this technique, he unwittingly becomes an entertaining bull. At this point, the interlocutor interprets the assertion as a challenge to accurately enunciate Calvinism. If the interlocutor is unaware of the underlying presupposition of universal divine causal determinism, which functions invisibly within the system, and we can now see how valuable its invisibility is to the Calvinist, the interlocutor has lost the game from the onset. He is charging full speed into a red cape, assuming the role of an unwitting bull. In many cases, the Calvinist's challenge is itself a misleading statement reliant upon ambiguity. The interlocutor thinks the Calvinist is asserting he doesn't know enough about Calvinism to critique it because that is what the Calvinist appears to be saying. However, the Calvinist's meaning is hidden. What he is really saying is the interlocutor doesn't know his unique understanding of Calvinism, which of course would be obvious and therefore easy to prove because every Calvinist is his own unique snowflake, having his own unique understanding of Calvinism, where he resides somewhere on the continuum line of determinism, in a location where he feels comfortable living with its dark implications. He might be an ultra-soft determinist. He might be a moderate determinist. He might be a semi-hard determinist. He might be a hard determinist. The Calvinist is quite correct. The interlocutor can't possibly know his particular and unique understanding of Calvinism. In the event, the interlocutor doesn't recognize the subtle play in wording. He will lunge head-on, full speed, into a bright red cape. In order to meet this challenge, if it is indeed asserted in earnest, the interlocutor must have done his due diligence well in advance. He must have a full and comprehensive factual knowledge of quotes from leading Calvinists, and he must be able to enunciate them unemotionally, accurately, in a sequence that is non-aggressive, intelligent, rational, and lucid. The Calvinist knows if the interlocutor doesn't have the ability to do all that, he can be dismissed out of hand. The interlocutor must also be prepared for the Calvinist to deviate from the leading enunciations of Calvinism and represent his own unique understanding of Calvinism. The interlocutor must have been keenly prepared for this strategy and know how to quickly respond. If the Calvinist chooses that recourse, the dialogue is then doomed, fruitless and destructive, as the interlocutor is at that point chasing after multiple rabbits, each having their own hole to escape into. When that is the case, it is best to disengage cordially, friendly, in a Christ-like manner. If any Christ-like, truth-seeking dialogue is to be exchanged, it must be agreed that the Calvinist will represent core Calvinism and not some unique, elusive understanding of it. Now, assuming the interlocutor recognizes the bullfighter trick and assuming he is able to respond accordingly, wisely, and coherently, it is then the Calvinist's decision to continue the dialogue or retreat. A retreat can come in a number of forms,
the Calvinist can insist he doesn't have time for such dialogue and leave. Or he can start throwing up red herrings to create a smokescreen, with the hopes that he can pull the interlocutor off balance. This tactic can be likened to putting a carrot in front of a mule, baiting the interlocutor with multiple carrots, leading him forward with each one in order to trip him up. The baiting carrot technique is a strategy which allows the Calvinist to retain control over both parties' dialogue, leading the interlocutor around in circles and baiting him, with the hopes he will trip over himself, which is most likely the case. If the interlocutor can recognize the carrot technique and he is able to reestablish control over his part of the dialogue, it can continue, with the hopes it portends the pursuit of truth. The interlocutor should be keenly on the lookout for clues within the Calvinist's dialogue to ascertain whether there is a focus on the pursuit of truth or a focus on winning. When the latter is the case, again, the interlocutor should immediately disengage cordially. When one partner is focused on winning, whether it be the Calvinist or the interlocutor, both parties lose. The person who appears to have lost walks away confused and the person who wins walks away satisfied, but actually becomes the bigger loser because his winning has simply reinforced his own self-deceptions. Another technique is for the Calvinist to pull additional Calvinists into the dialogue with the hopes of drawing the interlocutor into a game of tag, which will almost always result in the interlocutor's slaughter. At that point, the interlocutor will be faced fending off multiple aggressors. This type of event unfortunately resembles a wolf pack going after prey. It's best to be wary of it and cautious about getting lured into it. The interlocutor is not doing himself or the Calvinist any favors by pursuing this course, as it quickly devolves into a dog-eat-dog -dog event, which is destructive for Christians to engage in. Again, this technique is an indicator that the focus is not on a pursuit of truth, but on winning. It's easy to get psychologically invested in the dialogue and postpone disengagement. But one must be keenly on the lookout for winning or competition indicators. When a sincere and earnest and open-minded pursuit of truth is not at work, and in most cases it won't be, the continuation of dialogue is doomed to be fruitless and destructive. It's best to be Christ-like and be about your father's business. Part 33. Listing a few Calvinist types for those who are unprepared. Many mainstream Christians, without an understanding of the least visible and foundational component of Calvinism, are simply unprepared for truth-seeking, non-aggressive dialogue with them. The following list will help the reader understand what he might be facing and offer a few words of advice in advance. Ultra-soft, determinist Calvinists are most often the Calvinists, who by virtue of the fact they are members of a Reformed Church, are most likely to locate themselves as close as possible to the extreme indeterminist end of the line of determinism. Thinking about the darker implications of sovereignty is uncomfortable for them, and so they simply refuse to think about it. This Calvinist will usually respond in shock and bewilderment to criticisms of Calvinism, since his perception of Calvin and Calvinism is only benevolent, by virtue of the fact he prevents himself from recognizing its dark implications. Initiating critical thinking dialogue with this Calvinist is mostly likely fruitless. His mind is full of doublespeak mantras he has been taught, which the system engineers to minimize cognitive dissonance and retain belief. He's not a critical thinker. He's not emotionally prepared to face a rational examination of the system. He has mostly good feelings towards the Calvinist assembly he attends, and so he's happy right where he is. Unless his love for Jesus can draw him into a pursuit of truth, he will remain there as a dedicated, happy disciple, probably for life. Remaining cordial and friendly and avoiding dialogue in Calvinist controversies should foster your most fruitful interactions with this believer. The moderate determinist is the more serious Calvinist. He is a critical thinker. He can be likened to Plato's Spartan warrior. He has a bent towards philosophy and intellectualism. He learns Aristotelian logic 
and how to recognize fallacious arguments. He puts more focus on memorizing Calvin's arguments of defense. He reads current leading Calvinists and memorizes their promotion techniques and defense arguments. He has an urgency to propagate the system. He understands and accepts his need to rationalize dishonesty by deploying the standard semantic games used by the current star enunciators. He may have aspirations to be a star warrior himself one day, honored and revered by his peers. He may be sharpening his Aristotelian sword, hoping for a chance to slice the opponent and experience the endorphin rush. His pastor or other skilled Calvinists may be mentoring him for future semantic duels. He is learning the Calvinists' skill and trade. He's getting himself ready to slice up the enemy on the battlefield of language. The next Calvinist on the line of determinism is quite possibly the pastor. He has gone well beyond the Spartan warrior phase. He is dedicated to the recruitment, retention, and maintenance of the Calvinist fold and the work expected of him to maximize Calvinism's domination over its competitors. He has learned how to wear the mask of speaking with authority, not as the scribes and Pharisees. He knows how to walk softly and carry a big stick. He wants to be a skilled Esau who can please his Calvinist fathers and bring home the bacon. He may have the utmost adoration of the church's starry-eyed Spartan warriors who follow him around like a flock of little ducklings. He writes stern commentaries on serious church subjects, which he knows will never see any form of scholarly peer review and which most of his flock will embrace. And as the proverb says, believe every word. He knows how to scrunch his eyebrows and modulate his Moses voice. His congregation has no idea of the degree to which their relationship to him is based on dependency. He gains access to the personal lives of his flock and thus has the ability to hold his knowledge of their indiscretions over their heads, in a pastoral loving way, of course. If he doesn't have a flock of his own, he has no problems cutting a baby, i.e., an existing congregation, in half, in order to get Calvin's share. He may be applying for pastorship of some unsuspecting non-Calvinist congregation for the purpose of surreptitiously accomplishing a violent takeover of the church and its properties. He will do this by lying about his Calvinistic ties and intentions. He knows how to implement thought reform. Once in the church, he will immediately start implementing standard Calvinist radicalization policies, sending away for free Calvinist indoctrination materials and implementing Bible studies. He is on the lookout for anyone in the congregation who may catch on to his strategy, and if so, he will do whatever it takes to get rid of them. His is a holy war, and he its committed jihadist, who has no problem with the sacred lie. Once the congregation has been Calvinized, and the sign outside says reformed, and the property legally secured, he can relax, wear the mask of the Good Shepherd, keep the congregation under his psychological control, walk in the pastoral glow, and enjoy the fruits of his labors. The next Calvinist up the power hierarchy is most likely a star player on the current Calvinist stage. He probably has multiple PhDs and may be a very successful pastor or theologian philosopher. He is one of the authors of a continuous stream of Calvinist books, which are never, ever, 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 ever advertised as Calvinist. He is at the top of the Calvinist skill set in semantic magicianry. His ability at spinning doublespeak is simply hypnotizing, and everything he writes and says is a proliferation of semantic tricks and word games. He may have scheduled appearances on Christian radio or television. He is at the top of his game. He is one of the commanding officers in the Calvinist army, who has a cult-like following. He is a Napoleon on the battlefield. He is a Goliath with a Cheshire cat smile who broadcasts out powerful challenges to anyone challengeable. If he challenges you, you had better be a David and have five smooth stones and a sling, or he'll feed your flesh to the birds and wild animals. The next Calvinist on the continuum line of determinism is the elusive hard determinist. For him, free will in any form is a total illusion. He asserts God as the author of every conceivable hideous sin and evil, 
without blushing or blinking. It makes perfect sense to him. While he perceives himself as the true Calvinist, he is what other Calvinists call hyper. He is often a phantom to outsiders and keeps himself out of public discourse for the sake of Calvinism's reputation, unless he's a member of the Wesboro group. If you ever meet this elusive creature, it will be a once-in-a-lifetime event and you might want to get his autograph. The next Calvinist is the one we all love. He is the quintessential scholar. He is peer-reviewed and may be honored as one of the leaders in biblical scholarship. He never lets his Calvinism compromise his integrity. His commentaries are highly informative and wonderfully balanced. He has no urgency to persuade his appreciative readers into Calvinism. He simply does what the best scholars do best. He lays out the facts and the arguments from all sides and leaves you free to draw your own conclusions. He is not afraid of speaking the truth in love when he recognizes things he doesn't find Christ-like in the Calvinist fold. He is the Calvinist every sincere Christian lover of truth and lover of Jesus loves to love. We are extremely fortunate that God blessed him with all of his faculties and high ethics. Your every encounter with this Calvinist will be a godly blessing. He will hear God say, Well done, good and faithful servant. He is the exception and not the rule. End of part two of audiobook.